historic men shape the face of Idaho's capital city and leave a lasting legacy. An all-American pastime brings home barrels of sweet, juicy fruit. And an Idaho man's simple hobby sets a world record. Hello and welcome to Exploring Idaho from the downtown streets of Idaho's capital city, Boise. And welcome to Roland Barris, the new co-host of Exploring Idaho. Glad to have you along, Roland, because I know you love Idaho as much as I do. Oh, I'm so glad to be here, Dee. Thanks so much. I'll tell you, we're traveling in style today. You Indeed. know, it wasn't so long ago that the best way to get around downtown was by horse and carriage. I know we've all seen pictures of Boise in the mid-1800s when it was a thriving frontier community with dirt roads, log cabins lining those roads, and of course mule teams running down Main Street. But you know, you look around downtown Boise today, and with its traffic signals and traffic, it may be hard to believe that there is anything left of the original community. But the work of two remarkable men and others have left lasting marks on downtown Boise, marks that you can still see on just about every street corner. Architecture really represents the background of our community. It is the, really the backdrop that we walk in front of every day of our life. They're not just torn remnants of a history. They really are who we are. And every single day, they contribute more to what makes us unique. There is a lot more to a skyline than buildings and lights. Just ask Dean Gunderson of Boise State University's Department of Architecture. The old buildings that stand quietly in Boise's downtown tell novels of its history. Uh, uh, we make love, we make war, we make bread, and we make architecture. And when a historian looks back or an archaeologist looks back, they look at the remnants of that culture to determine what was significant to those people. And the greatest of all artifacts is architecture. Boise began building its history back in 1863. That's when the Army chose the area for a frontier post, and the city was born. Log cabin homes were constructed from readily available cottonwood trees. Main Street was lined with brick and adobe storefronts, and the pioneers flocked to the town. The gold rush in Idaho helped Boise boom and soon advanced the construction of a capital city. High quality sandstone quarried from table rock became the building material of choice. And as stores, banks, and businesses reached skyward, two prominent men emerged. They were a charismatic and talented pair of architects who around the turn of the century would do more to shape the character of Boise than any architects to follow in their footsteps. They were John Turtelot and Charles Hummel. They weren't the first architects in Boise, but there have been architects here before them. But they didn't stay very long. I mean, they'd do one or two buildings and they'd leave. What was different about Turtelot and Hummel was that they almost immediately established a, a, a uh, fully professional architectural firm, and they got important work. The grandson of Charles Hummel says one of the firm's first important commissions was the Union Block Building. Constructed in 1900, the massive sandstone building used Romanesque-styled arches, multicolored stones, and a well-balanced design. It impressed the right people at the right time and led to bigger, better, and more profitable jobs. The calling cards of the Turtelot Hummel firm was the picturesque. In 1905, Turtelot and Hummel laid the cornerstone for St. John's Cathedral, an ornate Catholic church that would take decades to complete. Almost a century later, St. John's is still considered one of the premier buildings of Idaho. When we step through here, you can start seeing the quality of light that comes through these, these brilliant blue and purple and gold windows. The lavish Baroque-style interior with arched ceilings, hand-carved plaster detailing, and splendid stained glass make St. John's Cathedral an obvious stop on walking tours of Boise's historic buildings. It was church architecture as propaganda. It was not just to celebrate communion, but it was to convince. Dean Gunderson leads the tours, points out the architectural effects, and explains how Turtelot and Hummel 
have made such a lasting impression in Boise. There weren't that many architectural firms that could handle commissions the size that the city demanded. And uh, John Tortolot and Charles Hummel provided the, an excellent combination of the political and technical finesse needed to execute large commissions. Just after the turn of the century, downtown Boise had grown impressively. And Turtelot and Hummel, with a half dozen major buildings to their credit, took on the most important commission in the state. This is the Idaho State Capitol, and it was designed by the firm of Turtelot and Hummel, then just Turtelot and Company. The trend at the time was to model state capitol buildings after the national capitol. It was a style with complicated angles and difficult design techniques. Under the direction of Turtelot and Hummel, the building came together flawlessly. You can actually still see right underneath here, you can still see the tool marks of the finishing pieces right, under, right underneath this volute. Stone artisans carved massive sandstone columns with delicate details. Inside, marble and plaster work rivaled the buildings of Rome. The capital immediately became a source of great state pride. Touching the granite and touching the marble gives you a real sense of the background and the worth, the, uh, the heritage we have in this building. Well, great buildings very often become the focus of important things in a city. That idea of making buildings into significant things in the fabric of the city is very much with us today. Turtelot and Hummel's legacy is woven through Boise in the city's historical buildings. They stand quietly next to the new, behind the sidewalks and the busy streets, and they wait to tell their stories. There's a heart and soul to a building, and unless you come in and see it and feel it and touch it, I don't think you're going to appreciate that about it. And a sense of pride and continuity, that all has to do with uh, one sense of place. If you don't have a sense of place, you're rootless. You know, you're not going to be very happy, ultimately, usually. So slow down one day, examine the architecture, learn about the details and the history, and listen to the voices that call across time. It has been a real education. You know, the architectural tours of downtown Boise are available through several different groups. So a little bit later on in the show, we'll tell you how to get in touch with those groups and set up a tour of your own. One of the things I'm sure you'd want to see on a tour like that, Roland, is one of the very first homes ever built in Boise. It's the O'Farrell Cabin, built back in 1863 of cottonwood logs that were joined together with a notching technique. Of course, the porch above the cabin was built in recent years to protect the structure, and the O'Farrell Cabin has endured. The place was built by John O'Farrell, a native of Ireland and an immigrant, back in 1863, as I said. That was the same year the Army chose to build a post at Fort Boise, and the same year the town was founded. A simple hobby turns into a worldwide competition, and a Boise man lands himself in the record books. And next, it's a slice of Americana when harvest season hits Idaho's apple orchards. Exploring Idaho will be right back. There's some. With the turning of the leaves comes a favorite pastime in Idaho. Fall is apple harvest time. And on some orchards in the Emmett Valley, the apple harvest is open to the public. So for one month of every year, picking big baskets full of fresh, crisp apples is a family affair. The Emmett Valley in southwest Idaho is well known for its production of fruit. Everything from cherries to apricots to apples grow here. And each year, Emmett apple orchards turn out thousands of pounds of crisp, juicy fruit. And while large commercial orchards supply grocery stores across the state, a smaller, different kind of orchard offers something more. Every fall, Pleasant View Orchard, and others like it, open rows of trees to the public. For one short month, all the regular varieties, bright red roams, crisp Jonathans, sweet red delicious, and others are ripe for the picking. A lot of people do it. They can't wait for apple season, and then they just love to go out and pick apples, so. Oh my God. For families or groups of friends, Wandering through an apple orchard on a sunny afternoon with a wooden apple basket on your arm is a timeless getaway. 
Oh, it's beautiful. That's why I picked today. And yesterday I was too busy with things and we so decided to take out and go yeah. and get some apples. Right. We got done with our get lunch. Our winter and apples. I said, let's leave the dishes and go get yep. apples. <laughs> That's more fun. Sure. <laughs> this is nothing new to experienced apple pickers like Helen Gussick and Olga Oberg. The two grew up picking their own apples. But still, every year the friends look forward to harvest time when they can get out and hunt for the big ones. Here's one. The crisp ones. <coughs> That's a good one. See if that's a good one. The best ones. Oh, that's a real dandy. Oh, I've always liked apples. Oh. My dad always saw that we had apples. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nothing oh, yeah. else, you know, in it fruit. It seemed that we always had apples. You know, uh, well, we can fruit, of course, in the summer. But uh, for fresh fruit, that's the only thing we had. Here's a tree with quite a few nice apples on it. Hand-picking apples does require a certain amount of strategy. Take, for example, the apple that, at first glance, appears perfect. Oh, these are great, big, huge ones. But on closer inspection... Oh, but they're full of wormholes. You can't just drop any apple in your basket. Across the orchard, the teamwork approach to apple picking is working nicely. Is that basket getting heavy? Yeah. Yeah? It's getting full, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Judging by the weight of their basket, Steve Proctor and his son CJ have mastered the high branch, low branch method. Here's some, CJ. Hey. That in here. Can you reach this one back up in there? Yeah, I can. Can you get that big one? Look at that big one in there. <laughs> some go to grandma, some get baked into pies, some are just for eating. Huh. This looks like a good apple. Just being outside, enjoying the beautiful day, um, doing something with your kids. There's few things in this world that you can do with your kids that doesn't cost an arm and leg anymore, so this is one of them. You may be surprised by just how affordable it is. Oh, we're just going to put all these in here. Yeah. Okay. All of them? Mm -hmm. okay. Picking your own apples often costs less than half the price of buying apples at the grocery store. And most times, the apples are fresher, sweeter, and give you more crunch for your bite. It's all apples. Uh -huh. Apples, apples, apples. See? It's a nice little getaway, and you can have also have some family time. And just come out and have fun, have a little picnic if you bike, or... Anything, it's just anything to get away from home and just go and have a good family time, so. That was fun. Yeah. We enjoy it. Special days like this, uh, you know, you couldn't ask for any better weather than this. It's just nice to get out here and do it. That's like going fishing. Roland, I happen to know you're hungry, so uh, here's an yeah. apple. And here's a tip for you, too. If you ever do go apple picking, the season runs from late September to late October, but it seems the best apples always go first. So you're going to want to plan your apple picking excursion early in the season. And we'll be right back. Still ahead, the Amazon of the Alphorns and the man who made it. Exploring Idaho will be right back. Have you given any thought at all to what you might want to do when you retire? Not nearly as much thought as I probably should have, Dee, but I'll tell you what, I know it's a long ways off. Still, I think after so many years of hard work, I'd probably like to take time to just kick back and relax. Mm, I think most people would, but not the man we met recently. And Jennifer Eisenhart has his interesting story. Sometimes it's the most subtle suggestion that sparks the grandest plan. That was the case for a Swiss-born electrician who had no particular plans when he sat down at his own retirement party more than 15 years ago. A uh, fellow talking asked me what I was going to do now that I was retired. So I thought I hadn't really thought about it yet because it just came, it just, just happened, you know. So one of the guys said, who, who happens to be a Swiss, that why don't you make Californians? The suggestion back in 1981 changed the course of Peter Weatherich's life. Okay, ready to go to lay the string? Yeah. 
Pete, uh, he's one of the greatest geniuses I've ever known in my life. But, uh, he's just fantastic. Vern Hickson understands what drives a man to push a small hobby to record extremes. After all, Vern started out playing garden hose and irrigation pipe. All my neighbors made fun of my parents because <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't afford a proper horn, they said. Today, Vern is the world's greatest performer on the world's least understood instrument. But most people have no idea what it is. I have to remind them of the recall commercial. For those who don't know, an alp horn is a Swiss instrument. It weighs 227 pounds. I've got it tight. It's traditionally played by young men, high in the alpine meadows of Switzerland. Okay. We got uh, number 10 and 11. Number 10 about, and 11. About in the middle of the horn. The long okay. tubular horns play mellow tones that echo up wooded hillsides. Now this part we're carrying weighs 55 pounds. This is the big one. Down, got to come forward. Okay, you're on. But traditional Swiss Alp horns do not require the use of hammers or string lines. And they rarely come in so many pieces. Okay, we need to move it over, please. Now, let me take a look. That's because traditional Swiss Alp horns usually measure a length of about six feet. That's better. It's 154 feet, 8 inches. No one ever accused Peter Weatherich of being traditional. Yeah. Which accounts for the string line, the hammer, and the helpers. I'm just a support lady. <laughs> right. And brings us to the point of our present location. You see, 154 feet, 8 inches measures out to... 47 meters, exactly. Or for you football fans, about 55 yards. The world's longest and largest. Fully assembled, the horn stretches into enemy territory at the hometown high school football field. I love to hear them played. They make really beautiful music. Yeah, what's your repertoire on this thing? Anything I know. Anything you know? Yeah, uh, the, this horn is long enough it will play any note, any key. Uh, it's just entirely up to the person playing it. I'll show you. Very easy. Can you go, can you buzz your lips, go. But rookies and television yeah, reporters be warned. We've tried to teach others how, but uh, there are problems. Yeah, problems. But when a proven professional like Vern Hickson steps up to the mouthpiece, the world's largest alphorn sings gracefully to the hills. It doesn't take a lot of breath. It doesn't? No, a lot of lift. Really? You just have to be a good kisser. <laughs> Vern plays everything from Edelweiss to Happy Birthday to oh, yeah. The Flight of the Bumblebee. We have to slow it down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever he plays, Vern makes it seem simple. But there is one downside to playing a horn that's half a football field long. The big disadvantage was the player can't hear it. For this story, we've turned up the audio that comes out of the bell of the horn. But 55 yards away at the mouthpiece, this... is all Vern Hickson can hear. I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> I don't hear it. He's been doing this since 1984. He's got so he just knows uh, what vibrations. I play what I hear in my head and hope it comes out on the other end okay. Whatever Vern hears, it's working. And Peter Weatherich's world record retirement project can play with the best of them. Interesting story. Thanks, Jen. And now for our Idaho Puzzler.
Earlier in the show, we told you how Turtelot and Hummel designed the Idaho Capitol building with an interior of white marble. But not everything is as it appears. Do you know what parts of the interior are not made of marble and what they're made of? We'll have the answer when Exploring Idaho returns. Did you know the answer to our Idaho puzzler? The huge columns inside the Capitol building appear to be made of marble, even on close inspection. But the columns are actually hand-painted in plaster. The effect, called scagliola, imitates marble so well most people can't tell the difference. Italian artists were brought to Boise to create the columns, which took several years to complete. Thank you for watching this edition of Exploring Idaho. And Roland, thank you to you. Great to have you on board. Boy, it's great to be here, Dee. Thanks so much. Looking forward to future shows. Me too. Really enjoyed also riding in the carriage today. So Quite nice. a treat. And if anyone wants to take a tour of downtown Boise, the place to call is Capital Coach and Carriage. Roland, we'd like to leave everybody today with a look at the bright colors along the south fork of the Boise River in fall. We'll see you next time.